Hey, what is going on, ladies and gentlemen? My name is Corbett, and I will be your host today for Europa Universalis 4 as we take a look at the opening moves for Dith Martian, and in theory, a good opening strategy towards getting the Lessons of Hemingstedt achievement. Dith Martian has some really nice ideas and a unique government to boot. You have access to some of the best combat traditions in the game, starting with plus 10% army morale Dith Martian traditions, and another plus 5% from your unique government. Dith Martian is also a fan favorite because of all the communism jokes you can make with it, so you also get free karma on the subreddit. So if you do decide to go for the achievement, this will be a good starting place, but this video is designed as more of a how to get over 100 dev and not die by the 1500s kind of video. So yeah, an opening moves guide, I guess. If you were to go for the achievement seriously, then there are maybe a few things you do differently. But in this case, we're just trying to make Dith Martian strong so you can continue your game in good condition. I hope you're ready because we're in for a long journey here. So as always, let's kick it off on the 1444 start date. So right off the bat, you'll be getting rid of all of your transport ships because, well, uh, they take up maintenance and you won't be needing them at all. So you can sell them for about 10 ducats a pop just about to anyone who doesn't hate you. So Denmark, Holstein, and Oldenburg for example. Then you should build up two infantry because horses are expensive. And don't forget about your merchants and please don't be an absolute idiot like me and put your merchant in the wrong trade node. Now you don't have very many options when it comes to your estates, essentially there's just not enough power to go around. But remember that you also don't have any nobility, which is well, it's kind of a double edged sword, you don't get any free generals but you don't have to like fix the whole land issue with them later on either because they don't exist. Remember of course to send out your ships to protect trade in Lubeck as well. And the last thing you'll do before unpausing is allying Lubeck itself, but remember don't join the trade league because you want yourself to be very competitive with the trade in your home node. And you'll always have other means of defending yourself anyway. You might be asking, hold on, wait a minute, don't you need to set your rivals, Corbett? Well, let me teach you a little something called AI shenanigans. Now, the AI clearly knows that when you're rivaling them, you're gonna try and tear them down to pieces, alright? So when you set your three rivals, they like to group up together using that little rival of rival bonus that I'm sure you've heard of, you might have used it a couple times to get some, you know, cheeky alliances, but it tends to draw the AI together against you. And this will make your life completely hell and let's just say you'll be stagnating for a long time. We have other plans for power projection. Now let one day pass by and we'll talk about getting more allies, but before that, check Verdun's diplomatic scene. If they're not allied to Mecklenburg and only Mecklenburg, it's probably restart territory. Yes, I know it's frustrating, but I promise you it is more than well worth your time. Moving back to allies, now, you've heard of these things called free cities in the empire, I'm sure. Those ones that get the extra special protection from the emperor. You should go ahead and ally those. Why? Well, who's stupid enough to declare war on them? And they don't like losing their status very much, so they'll just sort of sit there and develop while you get free favors. The best case scenario would be getting the two closest to you, but guess what else? They kinda hate you. Always. 100% of the time. Same with East Frisia, and he's not even in the HRE. I don't know how that happened. But yeah, so those guys are a bust, but there are more free cities anyway. Some of them won't ally you from the start, so you should probably improve relations with two of them that you want to ally. Also, try and get either Pomerania or Brandenburg as an ally. It doesn't really matter which, just go with whichever one you think will live longer, really. But usually, Pomerania will send you a free party invite anyway, so just take it if they send you one. So, now you have a whole bunch of allies, what do you do now? Well, remember when I talked about restarting earlier? That's because your first war will be against Verdun. And the reason why is because you have very limited expansion opportunities where you are, so you'll need to get started somewhere. So go ahead, hire one infantry over your limit, and let's get started. Oh yeah, this is also one of those times where you'll want to sort of do as I say, not quite as I do, because the day before you declare war, please set your rivals to who you'll be fighting. This is kind of really important, and like most important things, I tend to forget to do them when I need to. Now, 9 out of 10 times, Hamburg will rival Verdun as well, so even if you hate each other, you'll usually be able to ask nicely to walk around the straight crossing. This will help you avoid the fact that Verdun will have a much larger navy and will block you from accessing the strait. Like any good idiot AI though, if you move out of your home province, Verdun will promptly send their entire army across, to which you can walk back and just simply destroy them.
Then you should leave one troop on Verdun to make sure they can't build any more, then go over and occupy Wismar from Mecklenburg. Then you should back out of the province to lure Mecklenburg off of their capital, and then strike using their own retreat to finish the job. Now, in your peace deal, only take the province of Stedt. You can do what you like with Mecklenburg separately, but I don't suggest taking any of their land because you'll have restricted access to it and it might put you into a war you probably don't want. When Austria comes knocking for that land you just took, pretend you have your headphones on and they'll usually just go away. The unrest isn't bad enough for rebels to spawn assuming you raise the autonomy and they usually don't care enough to kill you over it. Speaking of raised autonomy though, when Stedt is cored, don't forget to state it and give it to the clergy for some free income. Now when the renaissance hits, you're gonna wanna be all over that. You get a splendor bonus for having a 30 dev province, and it'll take ages to get the renaissance if you don't make it yourself. Do you see what I'm getting at here? Yeah, so that's what you're gonna be doing for the next little while. And uh, don't forget to spend around 105.4% of your time looking at all of your neighbors for the easiest one to attack. Eventually you'll have an opening, but it might just take a while to get there. Your options to choose from are Brunswick and Lundberg, who both in theory shouldn't be that bad, but somehow Lundberg allied both Brandenburg and Bohemia in my game. So that was a lot of fun. Anyway, you'll be attacking one of those two at some point with the help of your free city-state allies, who've been uh, doing essentially nothing for a while. Now don't forget that at some point while generating tons of mana from being a republic, you'll have to pick an idea group or two at some point. I highly suggest economic since your income is still kind of abysmal at the beginning. Economic also works really well for Death Martian in general because the minus 20% development cost at the end stacks with your minus 10% cost from your national ideas, making Death Martian a great nation for development. While we're waiting for the gameplay to catch up, let's talk about how you'll be managing your republican tradition. Now, I find that it's best to choose a military candidate as the one you'll be keeping around for a while. This is because the extra military mana he'll be generating will allow you to spend it towards strengthening your government. In theory, this should allow you to keep him around for much longer, and your ruler can probably rule for around a good 30 years or so if you manage it well. With a 4 year term, that means you'll have a 666 ruler for at least 10 years or so. But there's even government reforms that you have to consider. For your first government reform, go to the one that gives you more republican tradition. For your second one, extend the term by one year. This will make elections less frequent, yes, but will allow you to keep a little bit more republican tradition and have the ruler for much longer. Well, hopefully that was enough time for the gameplay to catch up to where we are now. Here's where things start to branch off so much from my game that it's kind of hard to suggest exact strategies, so we'll move on to some general tips. When you're conquering, you'll want to generally move westwards where most of the Westphalian culture lies. This will make your unrest much easier to manage. And when you do take land, I highly suggest making sure the coalition that forms isn't bigger than 3 or so members. Trust me, they will mess you up if you're not careful. Also, don't forget to state court everything and give it all to the clergy. Just make sure you don't accidentally give them too much power or you'll have to revoke it all away like I had to. Next, let's talk about Splendor Spending. Since you're in the HRE, I'd suggest grabbing the Aggressive Expansion perk and, just in general, the War Taxes one as well. 
Once you've got the whole momentum thing going and you've become fairly strong, I'd suggest taking your next idea group as quantity. Your economy will be pretty solid once you've gone through economic ideas, and now all you'll need is an army to spend it on. Combined with your Dithmarsher ideas and traditions, you'll be one of the strongest nations militarily in the HRE, and as long as you don't end up on the wrong side of Brandenburg, you can probably keep to yourself conquering towards the west. Now just one final thing to look out for is Sweden's independence. Make sure to keep an eye out for their liberty desire and try to support them whenever you feel like you might be strong enough. This might also involve Muscovy, who tends to like to support Sweden's independence as well, and if you don't feel like losing a whole bunch, that's probably a good idea to wait for them. Alright, so that was my opening moves guide for Dithmarschen. It was kind of really hard to predict anything from here on out in your game, but if you follow the basics that I've laid out here, you should be able to reach the 1500s with over 100 development, some solid allies, and good expansion opportunities. Now that Dithmarschen is done, let me know what nations you'd like to see in the future. If you enjoyed today's video, of course dropping a thumbs up would be super appreciated. And if you're looking forward to the next EU4 video, don't forget to hit that shiny red subscribe button and click the notification bell to get notified when it comes in. This is Corbett signing off, and as always, have a fantastic day.